imagine a big hug from your mom. The milk you got from her is priceless, and it's hard to say how you can ever give back what you received because she made you. This is what the ancient Indian texts, Vedic authors, suggested about our debts to gods. You can't really pay them off, because you're not equal to them. They made you. The closest thing you can do is acknowledge the huge difference between you and the universe, that you can't repay the gift of life. This act of appreciation, or sacrifice, isn't like trying to pay a debt. Instead, it's about understanding that there's no repayment possible. It's a way to show gratitude for what is truly beyond measure. In some old stories from Hindu culture, there's a tale about two gods, Kartike and Ganesha, who were in conflict about getting married first. Their mom, Parvati, came up with a fun competition. She said the winner would be whoever finished traveling around the whole universe the fastest. Kartike, being adventurous, rode on the back of a huge peacock and it took him a very long time three whole years to circle the entire space. But Ganesha didn't rush. He waited patiently and then came up with a different idea. He decided to simply circle around his mother, because in his eyes, she represented the universe to him. This act showed that sometimes, understanding something deeply, like how much you care for your family, can be more important than rushing to accomplish big tasks. This myth shows that even in a mythical context, the idea of something being more important than physical distance or grand accomplishments can be found, connecting with the concept of understanding and value. When we exchange things, whether it's with our family, friends, or in a larger society, our relationships sometimes rest on things that we believe are unchanging and selfless, like love, friendship, and the sense of belonging. These things don't require us to count or plan because they're part of who we are. But when we try to view the world through the lens of transactions, we either ignore or pretend these things are not important. For example, we might say that a mother's love is always there, but when it comes to money, we might put it in terms of debt or giving without expecting anything in return. In Buddhism, there's an example of this with bodhisattvas who are kind and compassionate beings that symbolize an infinite source of redemption. This idea of infinite giving feeds into the practice of monasteries, where wealth is owned and shared collectively, almost like a long-lasting form of communism. It's about people working together for a common good. However, this communism faced a challenge when the need to grow expanded. Buddhism started using even charity as a way to spread the message and help people. This desire to include everyone and achieve salvation for all led to a kind of capitalism, even though it started from a place of shared community and cooperation. So, the balance between what was inherently, like the Dharma, and the desire for growth eventually shifted into a system that resembled capitalism. Remember, Jernet's perspective is that this shift occurred because of the continuous expansion of the teachings and the need to touch everyone's life. During the Middle Ages, there was a big change. The shiny gold and silver that people used to exchange slowly moved away from being everyone's everyday money. Instead, it was mostly kept in religious places like churches, monasteries, and temples. Money became more like an idea or symbol, and society started to create rules and systems to manage lending and protect people who owed money. In China, things were a bit different. The country managed to continue its powerful empire from the Axial Age even though it was challenging at times. The Chinese government kept coins widely used, mostly with small bronze coins. They did this by focusing on these smaller coins, which made it easier to use and handle. However, it was a big task for them to keep coins working well all the time. It shows how careful and significant their efforts were in their monetary system. In the past, when people did everyday business, like buying things, they mostly used coins when meeting people they didn't know. Local shopkeepers and merchants usually offered loans too. They kept track of accounts using special sticks called tally sticks. These sticks were made of split bamboo with notches, and the creditor and debtor each kept half. They'd come together at the time of payment, usually broken afterwards to show the debt was settled. We're not sure if these tally sticks could be traded or transferred from one person to another, because most of what we know about them comes from stories or side notes in books meant for other purposes. 
like funny stories or bits in ancient wisdom texts. One example is a story from a Taoist book called The Lazy, which might have been written during China's Han Dynasty. It tells how a man from Sung province found a half-tally stick and thought he'd become rich because he was able to secretly count the notches. This isn't exactly a proof, but it gives us a glimpse into how people might have seen these sticks in their day-to-day -day lives. Imagine you found a spare key, but you don't know which door it opens. The same way, when we talk about loans in history, sometimes we have to guess where and when it all started, like figuring out which lock a key fits. There's a story about Lu Bang, a humble policeman who loved drinking a lot and would often go on big parties, spending a lot of money. One time, he was so drunk he couldn't even stand up straight. While he was lying down, people saw a magical dragon above his head, which they believed was a sign of his future greatness. The shop owner, seeing this, decided to be nice and didn't make him pay for all his drinks. They called it even or, in simple terms, forgave his debt, even though Lu Bang had no money to pay. This story shows how debt can suddenly become irrelevant when people recognize a special quality in someone. Tallies, those small notes back then, were used for more than just lending money. They were used for all kinds of agreements, like when you sign a paper contract. If the contract was on paper, the creditor often kept a piece of it, like a receipt, which acted as a promise to pay an IOU. In the year 806 AD, during the height of Buddhism in China, long-distance traders who moved tea and officials carrying taxes had a big problem. They didn't want to carry lots of gold and silver. They came up with an idea. They gave their money to bankers in the big city called Flying Cash. These were special pieces of paper that said they would get their money back. They were split into two parts, just like tallies, and people could trade one part, IOU, like they would trade coins. When the government first saw everyone using these flying cash notes, they didn't like it and tried to stop them. But guess what? It didn't work. After a short while, they realized they couldn't control it, so they changed their mind and started making their own version of these notes because they saw how useful they were. So, just like how tallies became an important way to keep track, these promissory notes took over, sort of like money we use today, and the government got involved in issuing them. This story is similar to what happened in many places, where the government would sometimes try to control something new, but then eventually join in when it proved popular. A long, long time ago, around the early years of the Song Dynasty, which was from 960 to 1279, in China, there were banks doing some special things. They kept people's money and shiny things safe, and when people left their stuff with them, they gave receipts called promissory notes. These notes could be used instead of real money for buying things, even special coupons for buying salt and tea. At first, the government didn't like this and tried to stop it. Then they tried to control it by giving only a few big merchants the right to do it. But the banks grew even bigger. In 1023, the government made a special group called the Bureau of Exchange Medium. They became so powerful that they started making their own notes, using a new invention called the printing press. This helped them make a huge number of notes, hiring lots of people in different cities to do the job. It was a big deal, 